Welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, we apologize for the um, delay. We've had some um, technical issues, um, but here we are. Um, so my name is Estelle Nam. I'm a practice leader in legal visions, disputes and litigation team. I'm joined today by my colleague, Julia Simonovska, senior lawyer in our disputes and litigation team. Uh, before we begin, I'll go through a couple of quick um, housekeeping items. So we'll be recording this session today um, and you'll be emailed a copy of it. So if you miss anything, you'll have a chance to look back later. Uh, we'll also be taking questions at the end. Um, so submit your um, questions in the chat box and we'll try and answer them as many as, as many of them as we can at the end. And there's also a, um, a survey at the end. So we'll be grateful if you could answer them um, to give us any feedback. Also, all attendees are eligible to receive um, free consultation with us to discuss how we can help you um, with your construction contracts and um, any payment claims or any of your legal needs. To request your free consultation, provide us with your um, contact details in the survey that appears at the end of this webinar. So um, today we'll be giving you a high level overview of um, construction disputes and security of payment claims. We'll be taking you through the main points in the legislation, your rights and the process of security of payment claims. So this will include the purpose of the security payment regime and the main points from the relevant legislation. The protections available to building contractors under this regime, your rights under the legislation and the process under which the contractors get paid under the regime. So in this webinar, we're only um, covering the New South Wales SOPA legislation um, as we have limited time. So um, firstly, we'll discuss the purpose of the security of payment regime and the main points of the relevant legislation. So the security of payment regime, namely um, we call them SOPA, uh, facilitates a quick payment of claim, uh, progress claim in the um, building industry. So the regime is, to, uh, is designed to help contractors, subcontractors, and um, suppliers and consultants to recover payments owing under a construction contract. So it's designed to help with um, the cash flow by making the debt recovery process much quicker and cheaper than the um, traditional court process. Um, the SOPA regime applies regardless of whether um, you have a written agreement um, or whether there's a, um, there's a provision for um, progress payments. So the regime um, addresses payment disputes and um, cash flow issues, which is quite common in the construction industry. It applies to both residential and commercial contracts. So the key objective is to help quick and regular progress payments and minimise delays in building works. New South Wales was um, the first state to introduce the SOPA legislation, but all the other states and territories um, followed suit with um, similar processes. And just a quick note, SOPA um, doesn't apply to home building works where the homeowner is the principal. So those contracts are governed by the Home Building Act and um, we won't be covering um, that legislation in this webinar today. Now, um, next we'll discuss how the, um, the SOPA regime protects um, contractors and subcontractors. So next slide, yeah. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, the SOPA regime provides a statutory right to make regular payment claims and um, uh, and uh, makes the contractors to get paid quickly. So the legislation imposes strict deadline for principals or head contractors to respond to those claims. If they miss the deadline, then they're, um, they're required to pay the payment claim in full. The legislation also allows contractors to charge interest on late progress payment. The legislation 
um, imposes the um, the minimum rate of uh, the um, the interest rate that you can impose on the um, on the debt. It also allows um, contractors to suspend works if the principal or the head contractor uh, fail to make progress payment. And also, the legislation doesn't allow pay when paid provisions in um, construction contracts. So um, just to elaborate on that point, often um, construction agreements between head contractors and subcontractors um, have retention clauses. These clauses often say that the head contractor will release the retention amount upon payment from the principal, and those clauses are unlawful and therefore unenforceable. And sometimes um, those uh, paid when pay, um, pay when paid provisions say that the payment will only be made upon occurrence of a certain event. So this could be tied to the principal obtaining um, occupation certificate. Um, and that, that sort of clause is also not allowed. Um, there was a high court case uh, a decision where a head contractor withheld payment uh, because the agreement said the retention amount was to be released upon occupation certificate being issued under the head contract. The High Court said um, that clause was a pay when paid provision, um, which is not allowed under the SOPA legislation. Um, that's because the payment of the retention amount was dependent on the completion of the head contract, uh, which has nothing to do with the subcontractor's performance. Um, next slide. So now, who's protected under um, this regime? Um, SOPA applies to um, anyone that carries out works under the construction contract. Um, those works don't um, only include people who physically attend construction sites and, and work on construction sites, but also suppliers of materials um, and cons consultants. So what sort of works are we talking about? Is it just building works like demolishing building structures and rebuilding them? Um, no, it also covers smaller jobs like installation of lights and other fixtures, cleaning, painting and decorating. Um, it also covers external works like excavation, tunneling, scaffolding, um, as well as uh, landscaping. And finally, um, the New South Wales SOPA legislation covers works, um, only the works carried, in, carried, uh, carried out within New South Wales. Sometimes we see contracts that say, um, it's, say that it's governed by the laws of um, New South Wales, but the works are being carried out in Queensland. In that case, um, the Queensland SOPA legislation covers, um, covers those works and um, not New South Wales. Um, it's, this is an important point because uh, each state has different timeline for payments. Um, so to avoid confusion and to make sure that you don't miss strict deadlines, it's important to have a lawyer review your agreement. Um, so uh, to make sure that you invoke the correct legislation and follow the right process. Now, um, speaking of process, Julia will now take you through the SOPA process in more detail. Thanks, Estelle. So ju just to tie on to, to what Estelle said, th there's certainly, um, it, the SOPA process is certainly a complex one in terms of the timeframes that you need to keep um, in mind and keep on top of. Uh, there's a lot of online resources that illustrate how complex this process is and help navigate the very strict timelines um, to do things, including to, to make an adjudication application. Um, and those timelines are very strict and, and depend on particular situations that you find yourself in. So it's always a good idea for you and your staff to familiarise familiarize yourselves uh, with the process and with those uh, very strict timeframes. And if there are any questions, of course, um, it, it is worthwhile talking to an expert uh, or, or a lawyer with experience in the area um, about that in a bit more detail. For the purpose of today, I'll go through broadly the the main steps and, and uh, main steps as part of the SOPA process uh, and the main things that you should consider and, and some general points and tips uh, when going through the process as well. Uh, so first of all is the payment claim. Uh, 
Um, so in order to issue a payment claim, it has to be valid, uh, not just under the contract, but also under the legislation itself. Uh, so the main points that are required under the legislation is that the payment claim has to identify the construction work to which it relates and those which are essentially have been performed. Um, so this is an important point because a lot of times and in many adjudication processes, um, some respondents have successfully argued that they didn't approve a payment claim because it was too vague or not specific enough. Um, so that's an important point to consider to make sure that when you are putting together the payment claim, make sure it's very clear um, what exactly is included in it. Um, it might be the case that, you know, there's a general understanding um, between the parties, but it's always good to have that properly set out and explained in writing. The second thing that, that must be included in a payment claim is that it needs to indicate the amount claimed to be due. Um, so if there is a GST component, make sure that it includes the GST component as well. The third point is that it needs to relate to the work performed on or prior to the reference date. Um, so a reference date is essentially uh, the date that you are required to issue the payment claim. This is stipulated either in the contract itself. Um, if there's nothing in the contract, um, then you essentially just go by uh, the requirements in the Act. Um, so that is, uh, that's usually the, the last day of the month in which the work was performed and then the last day of each subsequent month as well. Uh, and the last and most important point um, is that a valid payment claim has to state that it is made under the Act. And that's as simple as saying, uh, including a sentence in your payment claim that says that this is a payment claim made under the uh, relevant security of payment legislation. Um, in addition to all of these requirements, um, there are some additional, well, there is an additional requirement for a head contractor. So if a head contractor is making a payment claim, uh, it needs to be accompanied by a supporting statement. Uh, and penalties apply if the supporting statement isn't provided, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the payment claim is invalid. So a supporting statement is an, essentially an, a, an approved fair trading form um, in which the head contractor declares that to the best of their knowledge and belief, they've paid all subcontractors and all amounts um, due and payable in relation to the construction work that, that's subject of the payment claim. Um, so some other tips and tricks when uh, preparing a payment claim is that it's a good idea to include uh, as many supporting documents as possible. So if you have any statements that detail the extent of the work completed, um, any completion certificate, delivery dockets, photographs or any other um, contractual documentation that, that's required as well. Uh, another point to, to consider is, to, especially where it is a large contract with many different parties involved, you need to make sure that you send it to the right person or the right entity. Uh, the best way to do this is, is to check the contract itself to see who you've contracted with to make the payment to and, and direct it and address it to that person. And the final thing to consider, which is a very important point as well, um, is to make sure that you are serving or sending the payment claim properly. Um, this is usually stipulated by a contract if you've got one in writing. Um, if there isn't one, then the legislation prescribes that service needs to occur um, during normal business hours at the respondent's ordinary place of business. Um, but to be safe, the best sort of options to, to serve a payment claim in the situation where it's not stipulated by a contract is one, to get a courier uh, where the respondent needs to sign on receipt and that can show evidence that it was received when and how it was received. Another good option is to mail it by express post or by post requiring a signature upon receipt. Um, you can also usually do it by ordinary post and email. Um, in terms of email, it's a good idea to tick the re uh, red receipt or re um, delivery receipt if that's available. Um, or the other option is to provide it in person, potentially at, for example, the respondent's business address. Um, so whatever option you do choose or, or whatever options required under the contract, it's a good idea to always keep evidence of service that shows the time, the date and the manner of service in case it's disputed later on. So the second step in the process is the payment schedule. So once a payment claim is issued, uh, the respondent then has an opportunity to issue a payment schedule and that will essentially be a document um, that must be in writing and addressed to the claimant. It has to identify the payment claim to which it relates. 
uh, and it needs to include the amount that um, the respondent is either proposing to pay or if they don't propose to pay any amount, it needs to state that clearly and provide reasons as to why. So again, where available, um, payment schedules should also include any supporting documents that you have. So things like completion certificates, photographs, if there are defects, for example, in the works that you're looking at offsetting amounts for, it's a good idea to get expert reports. So that could be an engineer or something like that. Um, and also a quantity surveyor report where you do need to quantify the amount um, to rectify defects, for example. Um, the other important point, similarly to a payment claim, is to make sure that you serve the payment schedule properly. Um, so unless it's stipulated by the contract, again, you need to serve it during normal business hours at the claimant's usual or ordinary place of business. And again, the safest way to do it is in person, potentially by a courier um, or something that requires a, a delivery receipt of some sort. And again, keep record and evidence of the time, date and manner of the service as well. So the next step um, in the process is proceeding to an adjudication. Now, you can proceed to an adjudication uh, whether or not the respondent has uh, put together or provided a, a payment schedule, and there are certain different timeframes in terms of how to do that, uh, but I'll just touch on uh, generally the adjudication process and how that will work. So essentially an adjudication process is a process whereby a third party determines the issues in dispute. Now, um, this is a very sort of quick determination process of the payment claim. Um, it needs to be in writing and it needs to attach the relevant documents um, being largely the payment claim, the payment schedule, if there is one, a copy of the written contract, if there is one, um, if there's a notice of intent to apply for adjudication and any other supporting documents as well. Um, in addition, they should, um, but it's not strictly required, uh, but you should um, include written submissions explaining the background of the situation, demonstrating why the why you disagree with the claimed amount or, or some of it, um, and the value of um, the works and materials and services for which the payment is, is claimed. And again, include any other sort of evidence that you have available, like the expert reports, delivery dockets, invoices, photographs and the like, um, that you want to um, use in, in support of your adjudication application. Um, now, there are a number of different um, organisations that uh, provide these adjudication services. Um, sometimes they're stipulated by the contract, but if they're not, um, then you have, um, you know, an option to choose from a number, a, a range of different um, adjudication providers, and, and they're all available quite quickly and easily online. Um, and again, when you do prepare an adjudication application, you need to serve it on the respondent as well. Um, same thing, so you should make sure that you serve it during normal business hours at the ordinary place of business and make sure that you keep a record of how, when, how and when and it was served. Um, in the adjudication process, depending on whether or not a payment schedule has been issued, um, the respondent will also have an opportunity to put on uh, a response, which will include providing supporting documents and some written submissions as well, if they have those available. Now, once all of the documents have been put together and provided to the adjudicator, the next step is to, for the adjudicator to review all of that and provide their determination. Um, so generally speaking, the adjudicator provides a determination within 10 business days um, from the date on which they notify the parties that they accepted um, the adjudication application. There are certain situations in which an adjudicator can extend that timeline, um, but th those situations are quite limited. So what the adjudicator can determine in their determination um, is the amount of the progress payment that, if any, um, that the respondent must pay the claimant, um, the date on which the amount became or becomes payable, any rate of interest that's payable on that, on that amount, um, and the proportion of the adjudicator's fees that are payable by each party. And, and this process is entirely in writing, so it's usually provided to the parties as a as a summary document with some orders and then some reasons accompanying it as well. Now, all of that is well and good to get the determination, but there are some situations in which um, a respondent actually doesn't pay um, what's been determined by an adjudicator. 
Um, and there are some options available to a claimant if that is the situation, and that's what we call enforcement of the adjudicator's determination. So if the, if the respondent doesn't pay the amount within five business days, which is usually what's required, um, the, the adjudication determination uh, creates essentially a statutory debt that you can try and recover in court against the respondent. Uh, now, in order to do so, you'll need to obtain an adjudication certificate from the adjudicator. And it, that certificate essentially states the progress payment amount that's been determined by the adjudicator, any interest, any adjudication fees owing, and the date of the certificate. You can then file this certificate in court together with the supporting affidavit and try and enforce that as a judgment debt against the respondent. Um, there are also other sort of enforcement options as well, including statutory demands. Um, and later on, obviously, there might be options to, to take it further by seeking orders um, to garnish uh, bank accounts, wages, or even take a lien over property um, that you've provided for, for the premises or for the works. Okay. Um, and another thing to, to remember is there are some situations in which you can essentially garnish the principal contractor or, or try and obtain monies directly from the principal contractor instead of the respondent itself. Um, but there is a specific process to, to deal with, um, to, to, to do that as well. Um, and, and if that is something you're interested in, you can certainly speak to a lawyer with expertise in this area. So I'll just um, head back to Estelle to just recap what we've discussed. All right, thanks, Julia. Um, just to recap, the SOPA legislation um, provides an efficient and cost-effective framework to help um, building contractors and subcontractors to recover payments. Um, so it mainly protects them by giving them the right to make regular uh, payment claims and imposing a strict deadline for the principals and head contractors to respond to payment claims. It also prohibits head contractors from making release of um, retention payments conditional upon something that's not um, related to the subcontractor's performance. So under SOPA, um, a valid payment claim must be issued by the contractor or subcontractor the principal or the head contractor has to respond by issuing a valid payment schedule with a specific time frame. And if the parties can't agree on the payment amount, then an application for adjudication can be made and an adjudicator will determine the amount owing, interest payable, and who's liable to pay what portion of the adjudicator's fees. Um, this determination can be registered as court judgment and enforced uh, as a judgment debt. And I just want to cover some of the mistakes that we notice in our clients' payment claims and payment schedules. Um, we often see payment claims not referencing the um, SOPA legislation, um, not identifying the works for which the progress um, claim is made, and not being served on the correct recipient. And we also see um, quite frequently payment schedules not having been drafted properly. For example, um, they fail to include the amount they agreed to pay um, or the reason for agreeing to pay um, a different amount. Um, so that, that um, wraps up the main um, part of our webinar. Um, and um, I'll hand, um, it's, uh, hand back over to um, Julia to um, discuss some of the um, our publication and membership. Thanks, Estelle. So um, you can find our publication on making a SOPA payment claim fact, fact sheet, um, and this might be useful for you for a, a quick summary of the, the relevant points, and you can access it using that link provided on the screen um, as well. Um, what might be of interest as well um, to you all is an upcoming webinar that we have. Um, it's called Don't Sign That Contract what businesses should review before signing. Um, this webinar will be uh, on at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the 12th of December, and you can register now via the link on the PowerPoint as well. Um, now, we're going to answer your questions shortly, but while you submit the last of them, uh, we just want to take a minute to tell you about, about the Legal Vision membership. So our Legal Vision's membership is a, is a cost-effective alternative that covers usual business needs 
Um, so for a fixed monthly fee, you can receive not only cost certainty, but all inclusive benefits, which include unlimited document reviews that can include reviewing your construction contracts. It also includes unlimited consultations, which means that you can book as many meetings as you, as you need um, with a lawyer in a particular area. And that could include discussing any payment claims you want to make, any payment claims you've received, drafting payment schedules, or some general advice on the adjudication process as well. Now, the membership also has some uh, offers unlimited trademark registration, contract drafting um, for a reasonable monthly fee, and there's options to purchase extra uh, credit towards more complex matters and ongoing disputes that are charged at hourly rates, um, such as, for example, acting um, on your behalf in an adjudication process. Uh, so if you would like to learn more about our membership, uh, you can request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar. Okay, now um, we'll answer some of your questions. Um, so I have one that's been um, pre one of um, our pre-registered um, uh, questions. Um, so the Australian home building sector has many issues with delays, non-compliance, poor workmanship um, and bankruptcies. How does the Act and um, the process prevent tradespeople from exploiting the system? I'll give that to Julia to answer. Yeah, of course. So in terms of delays, non-compliance and poor workmanship, um, these sort of things can be incorporated into a response to a claim, payment claim, so essentially a payment schedule. So there might be a basis um, under the payment schedule and in the contract itself that you can rely on um, to, to deal with those issues. And there might be certain things like offsetting amounts um, or liquidated damages that you can apply um, to, to offset any payment claim as well. So that's one way in which you could use them in, in the security of payment regime. Um, otherwise, there are other ways to deal with, for example, defects in work um, and things like that. So if it's a commercial uh, type of construction contract, that's usually dealt with within the contract itself. If it is, for example, a home building contract, um, then there is a Home Building Act, usually in each um, relevant state, including New South Wales, um, that can deal with those issues and the statutory warranties that apply to them and, and the rights and liabilities that apply to them as well. Now, in terms of, of, of bankruptcies, um, so liquidation as well as administration of, of companies, um, there's, there is a right under or there, there is a uh, a part of the Corporations Act that deals with that, so that's largely governed by the Corporations Act itself. Um, but it is important to remember that there is a prohibition on taking legal action um, in court against a company that's either in voluntary administration or liquidation. So that is something that you need to think about when um, you are going through this and whether there is an avenue available uh, to you um, when trying to get money from, from someone a company that's gone into administration or liquidation. Okay. Um, there was one question that came through earlier during the webinar. Um, so assume construction contract includes both um, commercial and residential builds. Um, yes, it's um, except when the principal is owner builder, in which case um, uh, the, uh, it goes through the, um, uh, the NCAT the tribunal um, process under the Home Building Act. Um, next question. Um, so how do you deal with defect claims? So I'll answer this one. Um, so if you're, um, if you're the respondent, um, then the one that's um, providing a, a payment schedule, there might be a basis upon which you can reduce the amount owing to the contractor. Uh, so when a contractor submits a payment claim, you'll need to respond by stating that you only agree to a uh, reduced amount and set out the nature of the defects and include um, any evidence um, to support those um, defect claims. Uh, this could be by way of um, attaching photographs. Um, the best practice uh, and best way to get uh, way is to get an expert like an engineer to assess the defects and the, um, identify the rectification works and then engage a quantity surveyor to quantify the cost to rectify the defects. 
Um, but remember, this all needs to be done within a very strict time frame. So once you notice um, any defects, it's important to get a head start on getting um, reports uh, lined up. Uh, we have another question here. Um, is there a way to claim unpaid sum directly from the principal? Um, what do you say to that, Julia? Yeah, of course. So this is essentially the question of whether you can leapfrog the contractor that owes you money and get the money straight from the principal. Um, there is a mechanism under the Security Payment Act in, in New South Wales and some of the other states as well um, to issue what's called a payment withholding request. Uh, and this is essentially a request to the principal to withhold any money that it owes or will owe um, to the contractor uh, and not pay that to the contractor pending the determination of an adjudication application. So in order to, to, to get use or have use of this uh, payment withholding request, you need to actually have filed an adjudication application. There's a specific uh, payment withholding request form that you'll need to fill in. You need to accompany that by a statutory declaration that swears that you have a genuine belief that the amount of money uh, claimed is owed by that contractor to you. And you need to serve both of these documents on the principal. Um, so once that um, principal received, receives that payment withholding request, they have an obligation under the Act to retain any monies due or subsequently becoming due to the contractor for work carried out. Um, the effect of this is essentially that the contractor or the respondent um, won't be able to use the money that's under dispute for its own purposes. So what will happen then is once the adjudication determination is made and say it is made in your favour as the claimant, you then provide a copy of the adjudication determination to the principal contractor within five business days. The next step to try and recover that amount is a court process that's um, done under the Contractors Debt Act in New South Wales, um, which is essentially the fact that you serve a notice of claim and a debt certificate on the principal contractor and, and collect your money that way. Um, however, if the respondent or, or the contractor that you're claiming money from actually does pay you that amount in the meantime, that obviously uh, ceases any right that you have against the principal as well. So there is a mechanism in which you can do that. And, and certainly if it is a situation that comes up in your business, you can certainly reach out to us. <coughs> okay. Um, here's another um, question. Um, so... So what if I issued um, invoices that don't comply with SOPA? Can I reissue a payment claim for the same invoice? I'll answer this one. Um, the short answer is yes, um, but there's a time limit. So you have up to 12 months from the date the works were last carried out. And if you have a um, defect liability period of, um, for example, 12 months under the contract, then you can add 28 days to it, which means that you have 20, uh, 12 months and 28 days to um, make a claim. Um, contracts can't reduce the um, 12 months allowed by the legislation. Um, and I have another question here. So how do you determine the interest rate and when to charge it? Off to you, Julia. Yeah, sure. So um, the interest rate might be determined by the construction contract if you have a written contract. Um, otherwise, the Act prescribes that it's, um, it prescribes an amount that's, that's payable under the Civil Procedure Act. So at the moment, that amount is around 10.10%. And you can charge this essentially on the unpaid amount of a progress payment. Um, that becomes due and payable. So from the moment it becomes due and payable is the date on which you can actually start charging that interest. Um, and we have one more question. Um, can you appeal an adjudicator's decision? Um, the answer is um, yes. Um, it can be appealed to the Supreme Court and um, the court has to allow it or, um, or so that you have to request permission of the court to appeal it so it's not automatic. Um, or the parties have to agree um, for the de decision to be appealed. Um, the, so 
and also um, the Supreme Court will only determine whether the adjudicator has made an error of law. Um, it's, a, it's quite a um, tricky process, so um, you should definitely get legal advice before you start this process. Um, okay. So that's um, all the questions we have. Um, if if um, if you have any other um, questions, you can certainly um, you can you can book in you can provide us with your um, contact details um, at the end um, in the survey, and um, so that you can you can get more assistance with your questions. And um, if you want to, and also if you want to learn about our membership. Um, so while this um, is a free webinar, uh, we value your feedback. So um, we hope you can complete the 30 second survey at the end. And um, thank you very much for um, joining us. And um, if you have any questions, like I said, um, provide the um, contact details so you can book in a um, complimentary free consultation. Thank you. Thank you.